Hey everybody, my name is Ted Forbes and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. And today we are going to wrap up our mini print series. And if you're just joining us, I wanna recap a little bit of what we've done. I will put links to all the episodes in the show notes so you can refer back to the other episodes if you haven't seen them. Uh, but in case you're just joining us, what we've done is we have taken some uh, negatives that I shot on this very Hasselblad medium format camera. So these are film negatives. And what we done is we took two episodes and we took two different paths of getting these printed. And the first path that we took is we actually took the negatives and scanned them into the computer, used Photoshop to manipulate them a little bit, and then sent them off to Adorama Pix to be printed. And the reason I used Adorama, I do have an inkjet printer here, um, but I wanted to kind of see what the quality was going to be on commercial paper printers, you know, the nice stuff basically. Uh, and so we're, we're going to do is contrast that with what we did in the second episode, which was it took the same two negatives and we went into the darkroom and processed those. And that was a very interesting episode. And the reason that I used two different images on this and not just one is one of them was very easy to print the exposure was correct I knew that it was not going to be difficult to print at all it was pretty straightforward the second one actually I had made a mistake on this camera when I shot them it was a flash error that I had made and I talk about that in those episodes and it was an underexposed negative and but it had kind of an interesting vibe to it and I wanted to see if it was still printable and it certainly was, as you guys saw. And what we're gonna to do today is I have my prints back from Adorama and we're gonna compare and contrast the two. Now, one thing I wanna mention on this is that this is not a digital medium versus darkroom thing. It's not a competition to see which one's better necessarily. I mean, there will be a little bit of that element in it. And I'm sure everybody that watches this will probably, you know, you'll make up your mind about which process you like better. And that's fine. I think, and I hate to spoil this for you, but both of these processes have their place. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I also want to talk about just, you know, what options this is what we've been looking at the whole time are available to you as an artist, as a photographer, when you're taking something pr from a concept in your mind into a final print and, you know, what's available to you. This obviously was a little mini series of three episodes, so it wasn't very exhaustive in terms of what is possible in the darkroom or what is possible in Photoshop. And we'll get into those things uh, in future episodes, um, not to worry. Um, but I wanna wrap this up today. So make sure, you know, when, after we look at the prints, watch all the way to the end, because um, I wanna talk a little bit about process and the importance of printing your work. And I think that's really important. And I think a lot of photographers don't do that and I think they're missing a key element that's going to make a difference in their own development as a photographer and as a technician and as an artist and all the things that come together to make up photography and I think it's you know that's unfortunate and so I want to talk to you a little bit about that and we'll cap recap all that at the end um, but uh, first let's uh, let's start getting into prints and the first thing I want to address is some questions that I had in the last couple of weeks so let's talk about aspect ratios and the mindset of going into a final print um, just off the base so anyway come on over and let's have a look okay so we're looking at the first of the two prints here we're going to compare these side by side the one on the left was the one I got back from Adorama Picks, and the one on the right is the one in the darkroom and you can see there's some obvious differences between the two, and I'll talk about those in a second. Now, and I also wanna talk about the cropping, but the reason I'm starting with this one, well, no reason in particular, but this was a problematic negative. It was exposed too dark. It was probably a stop or two down. And the reason was is the light was supposed to be like this one where I had a white background, but I had the flash setting wrong on the camera and didn't know it until I had already shot an entire roll. So, and had developed. So I wanted to see if I could still work with this. I did like the fact that it was dark and it was moody. And honestly, both these look pretty good. Um, the one on the right uh, is the one we did in the darkroom and it had, obviously is having a curling issue with the paper here. And that's not because I used bad paper, it's actually the opposite, I used really nice paper. Um, this is a fiber-based paper that I used for this and it does curl. And people have asked me about this and yes, you can get it to flatten down somewhat. Now the idea is that you would actually frame this and put it behind glass and when you put a mat down around this, if you do it correctly, it will flatten out. The other thing you can do is um, you can get a stack of books and you know, I would put some tissue paper so you don't damage your image and you know leave it under some books for a few days or a week or see what happens and you can get this paper to relax a little bit like that uh, typically though if you're going to mat this and put it under glass you know you flatten it out as best you can and you present it that way but as you can see obviously this is the Kodak matte paper over here this is a warm tone paper and just look at the difference I don't know if you're gonna be able to see on the video so much but this definitely the white is more of a cream colored and this warm tone paper, and that's the whole idea with warm tones, 
is it's actually going to use a, a kind of a cream tint to the white and what that does is it warms up both the lights and the darks so it just gives more depth to the image honestly between the two it's interesting that this negative was difficult to work with. The one I got back from Adorama, it looks fine because I was able to manipulate it in Photoshop. I was able to get that flower in the center brighter and I probably would go ahead and tweak this. Now here's a note about Adorama is that when you use Adorama Pix, it's very inexpensive. I think this was maybe a dollar forty for this print. And so, you know, do another one and get it right. And this is especially handy if you're gonna do really large blow-ups. You can order smaller ones, get them back in the mail, see what they look like and make your adjustments and move forward from there. Um, if you wanted to do a digital print that's an inkjet, yes, you can get, they're not the same kind of warm tone papers, but you can use the Hanamula stuff, which we've talked about before on the show. Um, it gets a nice texture to it and you can kind of get that effect with it. But what I really like about the darkroom print is, and it's, you know, obviously I wasn't able to get this flower in the middle brighter. I could work with that some more and certainly continue to do it. I like the way the darker is just warmed up better. Um, this could be worked with. You could obviously tone in Photoshop since you are printing in color. Um, so you could probably emulate some of that. But this has, a, there's almost a three-dimensional look. I mean, it's not 3D, but there's something, you know, the image, it, it's not just sitting tattooed to a piece of paper. It's actually kind of, it's got some depth to it. I feel like I'm looking into an image. And that's always been the thing I've liked better about Darkroom as opposed to digital. It doesn't mean digital doesn't have a place. Like I said, this is very inexpensive to do. I could continue to adjust the image and continue to work on it and get something that's fairly nice. Um, the other thing is I'm showing you something I made with my hands here. And that, for me, is very special. Um, there's just something I like about that that, you know, it just, you know, it, it, it works for me. Um, this was a slightly different exposure. Actually, I think this was a different, this was a different contrast filter. So I bumped my contrast filter up on here, which did help somewhat. And there's some other things we can do with this image. But um, also, let me talk about cropping really quickly too. When you, and this is what's weird, is like, you know, photography purists tend to like to not crop as much as possible. That, you know, when you take the image with the camera, that should be the cropping. However, what's interesting is that throughout the history of especially silver gelatin, that the negative aspect ratio and the print aspect ratio rarely ever line up. And in this case, we've got a square negative image and it's got to do something. So you have two choices when you print from Adorama or you do the darkroom. I can do an image where everything sits onto the sheet of paper like I did with this and what I would do is I would get into, you know, I would either cut those down with an X-Acto knife or you cut this out or you, you know you cover it with your mat and when you're matting you probably want to crop it just a little bit or if you want a white border you know you can adjust from there. The other option is to go full bleed and allow your image to take it up but then it's no longer a square image it has to conform to whatever the paper size is um, you know so anyway and you're going to deal with that and especially with bigger prints it's just the paper sizes get different so you know you're going to have to figure out how you want to deal with that i prefer to go a little bit smaller than the paper as i did with this image and then i can mat it accordingly um, so anyway let's look at the other image that i did now Okay, so here's the second image. Now this is the one that was exposed correctly uh, with the film. And what's interesting is, on, you know, just on a surface standpoint, again, you can tell the paper difference. It's the same as the last image we were looking at. This, this came out exactly like I had envisioned in my mind. Uh, I wanted a, a black and white lily with lots of interesting local contrast on a stark white background. And obviously on the digital side, this was accomplished very easily. On the darkroom side, I don't have as much contrast and there are some things that I can do to adjust this. I can use, you know, a higher contrast filter would probably do it, you know, just fine. Um, if I were blowing this image up, it's hard to do burning when it's this small, but it could be done. Um, it would be obviously easier if I brought it up. And by the way, in the last video where we did the darkroom, several people had commented that my darkroom times were really long that I was doing 20 seconds and in some cases a minute. And yeah, I had stopped the lens way down on those. And the reason is, is because if, you know, I were going to do some burning in this, I want to allow a longer exposure time for, you know, more concentration and less air. Um, you know, you can't obviously do a print in 12 seconds, but anyway, neither here nor there. Um, so anyway, so anyway, as you can tell, again, we have the, the cream color is nice. It adds a nice depth. It's, it's, it's a nice image, but I almost like because of the nature of this image and that hard contrast, I kind of like in this case the uh, the um, 
Adorama image better. And the reason I think so is because it just is a harder, it's a colder image, and that just kind of works with the tonality of this. It's not to say this is not usable or it's not good. Um, one thing I tried to do here is, is a little bit longer exposure time. You can tell we got some contrast issues with the dynamic range in here that the background actually started to get a little dark on me. So I think a better thing to do would be to reprint this once again. And this is, you know, again, it's the time consumption issue of the darkroom you know, uh, you're going to invest a lot of time in it. That's why you wouldn't do it probably for every image on every roll. But you know, it's always best to print, look at it the next day, make your adjustments, go back and, and correct them from there. So anyway, what I would do is actually work with a contrast filter, I think in this case, to, to bring more of that local contrast out. But anyway, as you can see, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we have just basically two negatives that did two different ways. These are both the darkroom results. And then we finally over here have the two digital results. And I don't think that either is better than the other. I just think they have different places. Um, I do think there is a quality to the darkroom prints that there's just something very beautiful about it that just speaks to me personally. Um, but that does not mean I won't use Adorama Pix as a service. In fact, quite the opposite. I will probably use this pretty often. And then for special images that I want the look on, then I think it's worth the time to go back and do. So anyway, like I said, this is not a versus uh, digital versus darkroom at all. But uh, anyway, I hope that you've seen some steps in the process. What's interesting though, when you're making a video while you're doing something, there's a lot to do. And what you guys don't see is the behind the scenes, the second dimension of this, which is starting and stopping and making sure I have the uh, scene framed up in the right take. Um, so these are really not complete, I think with the exception of maybe this one because it was, it was not hard to do. I think all these examples I would probably continue to work on. I would not consider them finished at this stage, but anyway, I think this does illustrate the point though and, and gives you kind of a flavor for two different types of printing processes um, that both originated in a film state. One of them was printed digitally and the other one was done in a darkroom and the differences thereof. So anyway, um, that about sums it up and uh, you know we're going to do more on this as we go and um, we'll cover some more advanced techniques. This was kind of a, a quick blow through all of this just to cover the process in its entirety. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of stuff today, and I want to conclude, in, and this is the part of the video that I was saying is really important because, you know, it's one thing to view a lot of these videos as kind of a how-to series, and one of the things I aim to do with these is to communicate something that is important to me that I feel is something that's a little beyond that how-to aspect. And if you're still watching this, good for you, and this is what I want to talk about. Obviously, this little series here was not exhaustive in any way, shape, or form of all the techniques that you could do digitally or in the darkroom. Um, it's three episodes. We just looked at the prints and some basic differences between the two. I think we got pretty good results. And in the future, we will cover episodes that go more in depth with more advanced techniques and some of these things. But it's really easy to look at these videos as a series of how-tos. But I think the important thing to take away from all this is what we're talking about when we're, what it means to print your work. And it, yeah, sure, sometimes it turns out great, sometimes it turns out awful. In fact, let's be honest, the, the, re, the ratio of awful turnout to really awesome turnout is pretty wide. Um, personally, I have a lot of bad turnout. I get prints back in the mail that aren't good. I get stuff in the dark room that's unacceptable and it's easy to get down on yourself. And that's not the point. The point is, is okay, let's step back a minute and I want to consider where we are at this point in time as far as what it means to be a photographer. And we have this, you know, culture that we live in and one of the biggest complaints that I've gotten really ever since we started doing the show was that people get frustrated and they get burnt out and typically they will say that, you know, um, the problem is is that today everybody's a photographer. Everybody has a camera. You know, these, these companies out of Japan make it so easy and so affordable to get a good camera and that, let's face it, the auto modes do pretty wonderful stuff with, so all of a sudden everybody's a photographer. Well, yes and no. Um, here's the thing, photography on the very surface as far as just making a picture is not hard, okay? Anybody can make a picture. Let's, good or bad, no point, you've made a picture. Making really good pictures is hard and photography thus is hard and that's the hard part about it is it's not so much how to get an exposure or how to, you know, take the picture but it's what you're saying with that image and what you're saying with that picture and what you're saying about yourself as a statement of work, what you're saying about your own style, what you're saying about, you know, the things that make you complete as a photographer. And, you know, I, it's weird to make these videos because I don't believe that I've achieved any of this with my own work. 
However, if I look at the people that I look up to, some of my heroes in photography, it's a different story, but I can see that those people worked very hard to get to where they are. Now, obviously, every now and then there's a freak of nature like Henri Cartier-Bresson who comes along or an Ansel Adams or whatever that kind of blows that theory and it just seems like they don't have to work at all. It's like the Mozart syndrome. They just, you know, crap great work. So, sorry for that. But, um, and then you have the Beethovens of the world who are, are, you know, it's more constipated. It's more they have to think through it. They have to get through it. They have to... Um, uh, you know, really challenge themselves and put up with a lot of bad work, but learn from that bad work to get to something that's really great. And I think that is the ultimate challenge that we all strive to do. Now, here's the deal. If photography would be easy, there would be no point. And it's not easy, and there is a point to it. You want to get better yourself as a photographer. So, really quickly, if you look at the landscape of where we are in the 21st century with photography, and you have things, uh, you have this whole online culture, and it really got really big when Flickr came along. And it, you know, obviously is even bigger today with things like Facebook or Instagram, Twitter to a lesser extent. Uh, and that certainly is a way of sharing work. And we have this workflow where we can use a digital camera, we can get that image and it can be online in a matter of seconds and potentially shared with tens of millions of people, right? And what we're looking at now is, it's a little bit different because what we've talked about is printing work and I think both are important. If you're not showing your work online, you need to. You need to have a website. You need to be participating in social media. You need to get that feedback. You need to see what people find interesting and what they don't. Um, and you need to get your name out there. I mean, that's just important for any photographer. If you're serious about this, do it. Um, and at the same time, I'm amazed with how few people actually print their work. And you don't need to print everything you do that would get very expensive it you know seriously if you take you go out on a shoot one day and you take 100 pictures you're going to get 100 prints and probably not you're doing the act of curating your own work and going through that and picking what might be really good maybe you don't find anything um we're not going to print this round and you next time you go out you try it again and maybe you'll print from that round um, if you're not printing at all, then maybe what you need to do is start printing maybe what you think are the best to start analytically looking at those in a way to move forward. Now, obviously, I'm very biased with this, and my personal feeling is I love the darkroom. There is a look that I get in there. Like I said a minute ago, it's almost 3D. Um, there's a way of looking into the image that, for whatever reason, even on really nice inkjet paper, I don't see in the same way. And that's not a slam against that. That's not to say that digital printing doesn't have its place. But what it says to me is there's something very special about using a darkroom. And there's very, something very special about going in and using your hands. And as David Allen calls it, it's not high tech, it's high touch. And you're going in there and you're making something and you're putting it out. Now you're obviously, I mean, you factor in with the darkroom all of a sudden, not only do you have expensive materials like you do with inkjet, you also have a lot of time spent in there. But the reward is so much different. Now that is obviously reserved for the things that you think are really going to be on that level. And I know the darkroom is difficult, not everybody has the space for it. Uh, I've heard millions of excuses of why people don't want to do analog photography. And you know, I, all I can do is share you what my opinion is on this. And my opinion is that, you know, this is not a dress rehearsal, this is life. And in the 21st century, we have a couple hundred years almost of photography to dive into and learn from. And whatever you're interested in, go for it. Why wait? You know, I want to be able to say that I did silver gelatin, or I want to say that I did wet plate, or I want to say that, you know, whatever process it is, because I learned from all those things, and I truly have a passion for photography that makes me want to go get some experience in doing those things myself. Am I a great wet plate photographer? No, I'm not at all. I've taken a couple workshops and I've done some wet plates, but I've had so much fun in that experience and I've learned from it and that's come into my life, into my work, into even when I shoot digitally. And you know, it, it, I don't know, it's all there. And I think the digital process is amazing, it's fascinating. And I think all the historical processes are amazing and fascinating. I think pinhole photography is amazing and fascinating. And it has nothing to do with the technology that's driving it. It has everything to do with saying something about the person who made it. And that is the interesting part. And I think I'm gonna leave it there. So anyway, I hope you guys have gotten something out of this. Like I said, this is a very basic how-to, but what I've tried to stress all along the way on here, is what it is that you're looking for as a photographer, what it is you want to go for, what it is you want to do, and how to make those decisions. Not necessarily how to make those decisions, but 
I'm asking you to go make those decisions. Go make some prints. Anyway, I hope this has been useful for you, and uh, we will return next week. We're going to talk about or change the direction again, talk about some different stuff. Um, so anyway, check out our website when you get a chance. We have all the show notes and links to things I'm referring to there. You can find that at theartofphotography.tv. You can join us on Facebook. There will be a link on the homepage there, and uh, obviously the Twitter and all the other social stuff too. So anyway, once again, guys, this has been The Art of Photography. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.